said I enjoyed so much about talking about God is that he's worthy to be talked about. You know, I mean, to put it bluntly, I know a lot of people out there, you know, they're kind of like hellfire and brimstone, and they like this whole idea of, like, retribution or, or God thundering in the mountaintops, or somehow they always have this picture of God pissed off or mad. Well, I, you know, I guess that's true in some ways, you know, maybe. But, you know, I find when I was studying scriptures, you know, and, and as I look at the Bible, when I first went through the Old Testament, I had an opportunity to look at it from a different point of view. I saw God not mad so much as doing things out of love from a loving perspective. Because, you see, I had somebody around that used to say weird things, talk about weird ways of looking at the Bible and talk about weird things that could be true if you researched them and you had to draw the conclusions yourself because he wouldn't tell us exactly what was true, but he would inspire us to think outside the box. And whenever you went to that Monday night study, you thought outside the box, but you made sure you wrote down in your Bible prove everything, check out, and make sure that you, you know, double check all the resources, or all the sources. Well, that person was Chuck Missler. <laughs> you went to a Chuck Missler study on Monday nights, you know what I'm talking about. Woo! You know, it was wild, but you got a grasp on looking at, in detail, more about the scripture than just the scripture itself. A lot of times you apply a lot of knowledge in order to get to the realization of what wisdom could be of how to look at what God was trying to reveal to each and every one of us. And that's what I see sometimes, you know, in looking at how church history or the church itself in different ages and different times seems to get focused in or zeroed in on something that God is emphasizing about himself. God at different times, you know, in the past, you know, in Christendom have, you know, emphasized, you know, like a Billy Sunday preaching, you know, that because of so much alcohol and so much during the Prohibition days, I guess, I'm pretty sure that's about the time that it was happening, he would teach, you know, hellfire and brimstone, you know, like, ah, cut him off, you know, God's going to get you, you know, and that, ah, oh, the devil's doing this, you know, God is, we're just that, you know, and, you know, kind of like this battlefield, you know, going on, you know, and you're just a pawn in the middle. Well, you know, I guess so, you know, works for them, you know, and I guess it worked for him. For me, I never saw it that way. You see, I wasn't looking for a deity that was like, oh my God, you know, out there in Never Never Land with, you know, thunderbolts like Zeus or, you know, chariots of fire like, uh, oh, I don't know, Thor or, you know, one of the Ulysses, one of the Greek gods, you know, running around, or or like, you know, some other mythology or some other extraporaneous, extra if I can say that right, extraporaneous, some way of looking at God as being like mad, or God being big and mad, or God being strong and mad, you know, kind of like you see in these Renaissance, you know, paintings, you know, God is an old man, you know, he's got a beard. I never really saw it that way, you know, and, and I thought, you know, maybe I was weird, you know, because when I got saved, I kind of thought of God as loving, you know, and kind of didn't fit in, you know, to the, the person I was getting to, though, because when I got saved, you see, I was looking for love. I was looking to be loved, and I wanted to find love, because I was a poet, you know, and I had a great imagination, I had great passion, great feelings, you know, I was able to project those feelings to exist on a level and plane that a lot of people don't really get, you know, touch with themselves, don't really understand that kind of level of intensity. So I would blow people out of the water sometimes with my intensity, whether it be for, you know, love, or emotions, or whether it be the logic or intellect or intelligence. Because I had great passion, I had great focus. Because of the focus, I had great intensity. Because of the intensity, people thought I was intelligent. Well, maybe. But really, bottom line is, underneath it all, I was looking for love. Because I grew up in kind of an unloving atmosphere. I know my mother loved me, but, you know, I, I really can't remember how many times she hugged me, you know. 
I know, you know, that I don't know my father that well because he wasn't around when I was born. Guess you could say that makes me a bastard. <laughs> That's what the old English word means. You know, a child born out of wedlock. Well, that was me. Hello. So, you know, I guess I kind of, you know, followed to those what they call broken home scenarios. Only, I didn't see it that way. You see, I thought I was normal. I didn't see any problems. Matter of fact, growing up, I thought I was pretty normal. But I wasn't, looking back on it, you know, and having three sisters, you know, it became pretty obvious that this idea of me thinking that, you know, I knew what love was was a little distorted because I used to call myself an only child in a family of four. Oh, wait a minute, that was my family calling me an only child in a family of four. Hmm, that's kind of a weird way to describe one of your kids, isn't it? Well, that's the way I was described. And yet, because of the depth of need inside me, I always had this great longing to be more of a family than what I really had. You see, I really loved my sisters, but I had a lousy way of showing it. You know, I would chase them out of the house. I'd chase them down the street. I'd chase them, you know, and yell at them and, you know, throw rocks at them as a kid. <laughs> okay, maybe in high school we used to yell at each other quite a bit. You know, we'd wrestle and we'd go, oh, I'm going to hit you. And then we'd, you know, raise a little knuckle and go like, I'm going to hit you. Good thing we didn't know MMA in those days. We might have hurt each other. <laughs> of course, I do remember a bite on my leg from my sister, one of them. I think it was Yvonne, you know. I think she bit me on the leg once when, you know, finally all three of my sisters tackled me. <laughs> I lost that battle. <laughs> but, you know, eventually we got over that stage, I think. And the reality of the love I was looking for, because it was unrequited love, was just something that I had idealistic ideas about what love is. Because I always pictured love as something, you know, like the father knows best or the Gidgets, you know, or, you know, some of the other shows that you grew up with television, because television became my obsession and it possessed my feelings because it was so inspiring. It was what went inside my eyes and went inside my soul and caused me to think the way it wanted to make me whole because I had an emptiness inside. And so I was looking for answers, really, without knowing it, from all the wrong sources because I didn't even know that I was being programmed. I mean, when television came out, nobody said, you know, in the black and white model versions, that, oh, this is programming, you know, so be careful, you know, you're brainwashing a whole generation. And yet, there's no doubt now, television is one of the most powerful brainwashing instruments in the universe. So don't even go there when you start talking movies or you start talking, you know, iPads, or you start talking texting, or you start talking about all these other things, because Jesus already said that. You know, he already said, well, what goes into the eye, you know, fills up the soul. So, pardon me, but you know what, if you're taking your eye in, you know, and you're looking at, you know, 24 hours of nothing but garbage, guess what's inside you? Doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. It's time for a garbage collector to come by, you know, start emptying out the dumpster, because you're full. As a matter of fact, you know what happens when a dumpster's full? It overflows. You know what happened when trash overflows from a dumpster? It starts to rot because it kind of presses down in to make more room. And then all that stuff that's inside the dumpsters begins to stink. Can you tell how much somebody's life has been affected by garbage in? Not because there's garbage coming out, but because they stink. They either got stinking thinking or they smell funny. Have you ever noticed that? You know, when you meet somebody, they kind of... You kind of feel funny around them, kind of smell funny, you know? Something's wrong, you know? And they just, you know, kind of like seem to have an odor from where they've been and what they've been. And that's kind of the way I was. You know, wherever I was, you knew I was there. It was obvious. I had a big mouth. <laughs> and I like to argue. Gee, I'm glad I got over that one. <laughs> Those surface issues never dealt with the heart that was full of emptiness that was trying to fill itself with the desire to feel love, to be appreciated, to be held, to be coddled, to be loved for who I was, not what my mother may have been trying to make me. Because you see, my mother did the best job she could. 
She was a strong-willed, matriarchal type of woman, and she did the best that she could, and she was very good at what she did. She was, the, as I tell people, the best father a man could have for a woman. And she was the best mother a father could have for a woman. But she, unfortunately, was playing both roles. And I don't know how to tell you this, but, you know, when it comes to marriages, you know, there's a reason why God made the marriages the way he did. And it wasn't just for, you know, the two shall become one flesh. But dare I say, when you have a father and a mother, you have two. And one more baby makes three. And that's a trinity. And that's kind of like what the Godhead is. You know, it's not that there's a similitude here. That's something similar. It's not that there's a, a metaphor here that is just metaphorically speaking, we're talking about the family unit as being a symbol of God. No, we're talking about God wants to reveal himself in the family by demonstrating the family. You have a father, you have a mother, and you have a son. Excuse me, you have the father, you have Jesus as the son, and the spirit is not a woman. <laughs> but anyways, the spirit of God at least fulfills that purpose of causing the same effects with which a woman influences the family and the home and brings forth life because we know that the Spirit of God caused Jesus to come alive. We know that God used the Spirit of God in order to raise up Jesus from the dead. We know that the Spirit filled Jesus. And a lot of times that's what God reveals to us as far as the family unit is concerned about how much of an effect each member in part has for the conglomerated whole. The Godhead is symbolic and a metaphor, well, metaphor, and a typology of the the family unit, father, mother, and son, is a typology of the Godhead. There we go. Because it says that all of creation reveals itself of God's very nature, even, and everything else that goes with the even, which is everything. I mean, it's not just, you know, the trees and the plants and the seas, you know, and the birds and the bees and all those other things that we see that we know by Romans that it reveals his nature and the Godhead and you know, that Paul talked about in Hebrews also. But rather, we find itself true in the family, too. And you can usually find issues of religious problems or religious, religious issues that are causing problems in a family from the previous history of the family unit that the person came out of. What was your father like? What was your mother like? What was you? What are you like in being raised up in that family? And those things, while they don't stop you from being changed, they do influence you from who you are. You're not a product of your environment, no, but you are a byproduct of that environment, yes. Because you see, there's an affectation and an infection that goes on. The infection is what the world does to you. The affectation is how the world influences you. The affectation is the outward manifestation of something trying to influence you, to get inside you, to affect you. The infection is the things that go inside you and that cause corruption, that causes you to be corrupted, that come out of you, that actually prevents you from moving into salvation and discovering for yourself what God has provided for you, which is, amazingly enough, peace. Oh, that's not in the world. <laughs> love. Well, that's obviously not in the world, or it is in the wrong way, shape, and form, because somehow that don't look like love to me. <laughs> And joy. Well, we know that they're joy, but not quite the kind that, you know, God was talking about. So, you see, I noticed that in my perspective, when I was reading the Bible, I didn't see it the same way most people did. I saw from Genesis to Revelation that God was love manifested, reaching down to humanity infested and corrupted with this kind of problem that it could not resolve itself, it could not be fixed, and that God was always giving opportunities to come to him in order to be made whole, to come to him in order to be made restored, to come to him in order to have salvation from whatever fix they were in at the time, whatever problem they were facing. It seemed to me every time that I read through the scriptures, and I read through it a lot of times, you know, the Old Testament wasn't a God of wrath, it wasn't some God that was beating him up, it was God saying, hey, come to me. I'll help you. Come to do what I tell you. This works. This is life. And you know, I read Deuteronomy, you know, and I know a lot of people don't read Deuteronomy, but you know, I read Deuteronomy over again, two or three times. I got it. Now, I don't know if anybody else didn't get it, but I'm sorry, you know, maybe it's a Jewish mind or something. I don't know. Maybe there's a, maybe there is an ethnicity towards understanding certain things. <laughs> oh boy. Let's go back through Deuteronomy again. Get Leviticus 2 and throw it in and just read it four or five times. Matter of fact, you know, it's interesting that James Michener, in his book, The Source, said that there's a Jewish proverb 
very good Jewish proverb. And the main character is telling this other character, I think he's a Catholic, you know, telling a, another character about... Matter of fact, I think it's a Jew and a Catholic, but you'll have to read the source by Michener again for me to be right about this. But in this story, there's an archaeological dig, and you know, it kind of uses the the story of the archaeological dig to go back all the way to the beginning of Israel before it was Israel, when it was Canaan, or when it was back into the early days, you know, with just a stone there. And Michener, as he always does, tells a wonderful story all the way through up to modern times. But when they get to closer towards modern times, he said, you know, if you want to understand a Jewish mind, he says, very simple. He says, read Deuteronomy or Leviticus. I'm not sure if it's Leviticus or Deuteronomy. One of the two, or maybe both. But the point is, is one of the two or the both, that you read it six times in a row. And by the time you read it the seventh time, you'll be a Jew. Try it. It's interesting. You know, now maybe you won't, you know, and maybe you think it's really boring, but I kind of found it interesting. <laughs> because the integrity of the Word of God in and of itself of what's in Deuteronomy blew my mind and it gave me a appreciation of the intensity and the focus with which God was driving home certain principles and points of life itself and how much he wanted us to experience better than what we had already and these were things that actually in my mind made perfect sense because I was looking at them but well yeah I and I would extend them outward, and I'd think logically, you know, kind of like, you know, well, what would this, how would the ramifications of this be, if I wasn't a Christian, how would the ramifications of this be if a society didn't have any rules, regulations, or laws, and you're starting all the way from scratch with just one man and a family unit, and where would you go, you know, especially if you've been already absorbed into a culture, and how would you deal with this, and, you know, how would you begin to structure a society, and how would you set up its rules, its regulations, its civil code, its moral code? And, you know, I kind of had these thoughts. Now, I admit, you know, not everyone thinks like I do. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Boring. But I was thinking that when I read through the scriptures. And so, for me, that part of it made perfect sense. God was doing something that was loving. He was bringing a people to himself. He was bringing a relationship to himself. He was teaching someone how to know him. And, you know... When I got to the New Testament, it made perfect sense when Jesus came along and said, Hey, look, you know, you've been screwing up for a long time now, buddies. You know, you need to get it right. I mean, God was letting you kind of get away with some things, you know, and you're like, ah, maybe you got this divorce thing all mixed up, you know, maybe you've been trying to shuffle and fast shuffle, you know, when you're doing the song and dance with scribes and Pharisees and, you know, throwing a little Greek mythology in here, you know, trying to make this temple thing work, you know, and it ain't. Well, here I am. You got a problem? You know, talk to me. I can tell you the answer. But I don't think you want to hear what God has to say. And they didn't want to hear what God had to say because, after all, he was God. He was the Son of God. And when he spoke, people listened. And they didn't want to listen. As a matter of fact, you could sum it all up in the book of Acts, and you could sum it all up in the Gospels, too, when they said, better that one man should die than the whole nation should perish. In a kind of warped allegory of Jewish mindset, they almost got it right. Better that one man should die so that the whole nation could be saved, which is what really happened. But they reversed it by saying the better that one man should perish than the whole nation perish. And the whole nation perished anyways. I mean, technically, because it got diaspora, or in other words, it got cast out from Israel, the land itself, from the promised land. It was spread out into the nations in order to fulfill the prophecy that eventually God would bring them all back. And so, you know, in being sent, you know, outward, you know, from that time, you know, gradually it became obvious that they had rejected the one person who was the object of their religious endeavors. God himself, God with us, Emmanuel. But it had already been prophesied and said that that was meant to be because even in that, if you wanted to see that as not loving, I saw it as loving because it said that, oh, guess what? The farther you read, you went into Hebrews and you said, well, it's a good thing that this happened because then, guess what? The Gentiles get in. I went... I'll be darned. You mean they weren't in before? So I kind of flipped it back into the Old Testament and started doing a study, you know, like, didn't Gentiles get in? I thought, you know, Jesus' genealogy had Gentiles in it. Oops. So much for pure blood. You know, and then I used to get all these people that would tell me all these weird ideas about how they thought, oh, you know, like you had to be pure, like Seth's line or this line or that line or whatever line. And they were giving me a line, all right. But it wasn't love that the line was being thrown out and they weren't trying to hook, line, and sinker me with, you know, kind of making a relationship with me or trying to get me, you know, in the sack or in the rack or wherever they are that they're trying to do these things that were an attack on my 
you know, purity of faith, you know, in the sense that I was looking at the scriptures and saying, God, I want to know you and I want to know what love is. I wound up looking for love in all the wrong places later. No, when I was looking in the Word of God, I found love. It was obvious to me. It was so pure and so simple and so intelligent and so wise and so beyond my understanding that I was amazed. And you know, that's kind of where I got to today. You know, it's like I finally went, you know, and I've been living my life for a long time. You know, I've been doing those things that God told me to do, you know, all along in my life, you know, enjoying the goodness of the Lord, you know, as well as, you know, His chastisements and His teachings and His lessons, you know, and learning that you reap what you sow, you know, and learning all these different things that, you know, you, you're learning them, you know what they are, right? You do, you don't, maybe. But I kind of, you know, discovered that in these latter days, in these last days, though I have studied the scripture extensively, you know, I probably could go out and get, you know, some kind of THD, PhD, and RHD, and, you know, get the ABCs and the CBS and the NBCs all together, and we can make an alphabet, you know, from the alphabet all the way to the alpha omega, and play with seven different languages if we wanted to, but, you know, we won't go there. Because it's kind of like, you know, when you start rapping and japping, you know, and you start hip hopping and bebopping, you know, you realize that, you know what, people are getting stupider, not smarter. Or maybe they're getting smarter, not stupider, and they just can't get it because they're all becoming like little children, and the little child shall lead them, so they all wanted to be the little child that was going to lead them, so they're leading them somewhere, but we don't know where they're going. You get that? I do. But the point being is that I wanted to see more of the reality of what happened to the Jesus people that I grew up with. It's like, hey, man, you know, we grew up with looking for love in all the wrong places, you know, like the hippie movement. And we found love in Jesus. You know, we kind of like, I got it. I get it. We got it. We go. We do it. You know, we went out and we did what we could. You know, and that was the way that it worked. Do your best and pray that it's blessed and Jesus takes care of the rest. Yeah. You know, we were kind of like, you know, worship kind of naive, but, you know, we, we were there. You know, we, we got in the Word. You know, we did our thing. Then we kind of got settled in our leaves, I think. You know, at least that's the way it looked like to me because it was like almost everybody that I know got involved in something else to grow, you know, and they kind of got involved in this, that, and the other thing, you know, and some of them had children and big, giant mega ministries, and man, I mean, God bless them for mega ministries, but it was like, I don't really think that's what I want to be, you know, and thank God Jesus never made me into becoming like that, you know, but praise the Lord, there's a lot of them, you know, and so I was glad to see that, you know, and then I got involved one time in a little tiny, you know, like community church, and it was like, Wow! The intensity, the focus, the direction that it was going was so pure and holy. It, of course it would fail, you know, because it was like mm, a little off on their words. So it was like, once you're off on the foundations, you know, guess what? You're going to go off somewhere on the uh, revelation of what you're, you're revealing God to be. And that's kind of what I began to discover about these latter days. People are beginning to reveal where their foundation's from. Is their foundation laid upon the gospel of grace? Or is it upon a foundation of judgment? You know, I know some people are saved from fear, and some people are saved from love, some people are saved from, you know, addictions and, you know, whatever they may have gone through in life. But, you know, I'm wondering, the ones I see that are really, you know, impacting my life, or the ones that I see that really have something to say to me, are the ones that are being loved by God, not were loved by God. The ones that are promoting this idea that, guess what? God loves you. Yes, it's true. There's a hell. Yes, it's true. You're not supposed to go there and you know, you could you could avoid that. But the important aspect of the content of what's being said is that let's get back to the basic of what God is. Let's get back to the reality of who God is. Let's get to the foundation stone that was laid, that no other man can lay any other foundation stone except that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I don't mean Jesus being the cornerstone of it being that somehow we're going to, you know, like, take that as an atonement theological premise, you know, and start making our own little religion, you know, Christianity out of it, and start going, you know, structure-wise, building houses, building temples, building synagogues, building this, building that, building, you know, whatever. But the cornerstone, the very cornerstone of what Jesus said was simply this. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Oh. Okay. And disciples went, well, all right. Because they loved the Father. You see, they understood. 
the Holy One of Israel. But they didn't understand the Father. Sometimes I think we go the other way, but you know, that's a different story in a different time and a place. But they wanted to see the Father that Jesus kept talking about. Who's this guy you keep talking about? It's not the one that the rabbis say, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees have said, you know, exactly what to be in order to be there with him. And Jesus said, yeah, they were, they're right. Do what they say. Watch what they do, but do what they say. It's true. You can't get to heaven unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Unless you're perfect, you won't make it. And so you see that in a lot of what the Pharisees were saying, yeah, it was not so bad. Deuteronomy here, you know, read it. You know, it's kind of interesting, you know, pretty cool, you know, kind of stuff. But the reasoning for what it was meant to do wasn't accomplished by what they found out in the long run when the Son of God came and spoke to them about what was true. Is that the law was good for regulating yourself, but it wasn't good for justifying yourself. You could live according to some laws that you obviously do in society today, and we call them, you know, our judiciary, we call them our legislative, we call them the, the laws with which we govern ourselves inside of a, you know, intelligent society, a democracy of this case, or a republic, whichever you want to look at it, however you want to think of it. But the point being is that we have civil laws, we have moral laws, and we have legal laws, or jurisprudence that operates within the legal code that we've set up for ourselves according to the Constitution and the laws with which we operate under governance. And by that governance, which was instituted by men inspired by God, not God inspired them to set up a government, but rather that they were inspired by God and then they went out and used their intelligence to set up a government, is that our governance was meant to regulate us so that we could do that with which God wanted us to do in the first place. And it's not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's love. Because you see, if you love, you get life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if you don't love, you could pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness the rest of the days of your life and never get them. You'll be clawing, scratching, arguing, debating, crying, changing, rearranging, and amending everything that you know about society and man in general in order to get your little share of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you'll never arrive there. You'll always be trying to fulfill something you can only get one way. By love. No, really. You can't get happiness unless you're loved. You can't get the pursuit of happiness, really. I mean, you could keep doing that forever, but you know, you really can't be in pursuit of happiness because you're heading in the wrong direction. You're trying to get something you're never going to get. And sooner or later, you figure it out and you go, well, I think I got it, but I'm not happy. And then you think you got liberty and you find out that you're more entangled in laws than you ever were. And so you don't have liberty and you start blaming it on other people and you realize the blaming doesn't work either because you become bitter. So your life has become bitterness and you're no longer in the pursuit of happiness and now your life has no meaning and you suddenly take life for granted. You start treating life as though it were meaningless. And so you take others' lives and you begin to forget what it's all about. And that's why I find in my gospel, I boil it back down to something simple. Love. Because you see, I wasn't looking for you know a legal code. I wasn't looking for a civil code. I already knew all about the government because I was already a hippie and I could protest anything. I already read the Bible through and through and I went, you know, this is good, you know, and I was at Calvary, you know, and I was like, well that's cool, you know, and I got the right, you know, foundation laid. But it wasn't enough of love for me unless God made love real in my everyday life for me to exist. And so God began to do that in my life. He began to reveal that it wasn't just enough to be loved, but that I had to choose love. And if my wife's listening, she's going, uh-oh, <laughs> here it comes. Now he's getting to the point, <laughs> a long way around. No, but my gospel really is that. God chose to love you. Bottom line, he chose you. He chose to love you. And so he did everything in his power to bring that about in all of the circumstances of your life and in all the realities of everything you're ever going to learn in the Bible. It's going to boil down to one thing and one thing alone. He chose you to love you and that he's demonstrated that through his son. And that if you decide to respond to that love and you want to be loved, you get the rest, the whole ball of wax. You get the kid and caboodle. You get life, liberty, pursuit of happiness if that's what you want. You know, I mean, if you really want to go there, you know, go ahead. You know, 
personally i think i like better what's going on in the governance of god in heaven than i like in the governance of man on earth but you know you could enjoy it while it's here you know because it ain't gonna last it's all gonna burn As a matter of fact it's going away really quick here but the point is being loved is what god does to you it's his nature he from the moment of genesis in creation has always been about revealing his nature he has always been love and he never changes god is love and that's what the gospel is god loving you he's provided a way to love you because quite frankly you were doing a little stinking thinking you know and you got a little dirty you know you wanted to clean you up a little bit you know but he loves you as you are basically the way you are because he sees you in light of what his son has done for you I don't know how he does that I think he just puts on you know his little spiritual glasses and he says who are you you ugly and then he puts on his Jesus glasses and goes, oh, you're beautiful gorgeous wonderful fantastic you know let me look at you through the blood again yeah hey you look great good job well done thou faithful servant now obviously God doesn't put on spiritual glasses that's a Joseph Smith trick in trying to do something else about some other religion. But the point being, God sees you at the end of time as though it were the beginning of time because he's outside of our comprehension and we can't even begin to fathom except to accept what Jesus says about our Father. And what Jesus says about our Father is that he's love. And so I used to blow people's minds because I'd say, you can tell me about the Canaanite wars, you know, and when you know Israel was moving into the land and they killed all the nations and killed all the people and killed the cattle and this, that, and the other thing. And you can think it's not love, but if you want to spend seven hours with me, I'll prove it's love. Eh, nobody wants to spend seven hours with me. <laughs> but I'll throw that out to you. You want to come over my house? Come on over my house and my house. Come on over my house and my house. I give you. I don't know what it is, the song. But it was one of those songs that, you know, I think it was something about, you know, love and happiness or food or something, you know, and being nice, you know. Because in those days, they kind of like weren't so crazy about their lyrics like nowadays. But God loved me. So he died for me. And when I found out he chose me, I went, huh. Pardon the expression, but damn. Now what do I do? Well, the truth you just be loved. Wait a minute. What do you mean you be loved? Yeah. You let God love you and it'll change everything in your life. It's not grace changes things, although that's a nice concept. Grace is a, you could call it an action of love or a manifestation of the reality of the spiritual aspects of the kind of love that the Holy Spirit has of the nature of God as it works through the physical plane of this universe in and of itself in the individual in order to manifest that with which God has already done in the spiritual plane and in extending this formula of grace to which you are already applied to and have been given for the justification of your sins and that you were made for atonement to become at one with God and the only way to do that because you were imperfect in order to become perfect you'd have to have your incorruption or you'd have to have your corruption put on incorruption and the only way to accomplish that in the spiritual realm was for there to be grace extended so that God would accept you to come closer to him so that he could change your nature and become born of that nature that is of heaven which means that the born of the spirit or born from above as we say and Hebrew, you know, the Jew, Jewish aspect mindset of it. But, you know, we say in the modern days, you know, born again, which is born of the Spirit. You know, so we say that was born of flesh, born of flesh, that was born of Spirit, born of Spirit. So you have the Spirit of God causing a newness and a revelation of Jesus himself in and that of what he has done for you and making you to become what God is. Huh? Yeah. Love. Did you know that? That's what you are. You're God's example of love. Yeah, really. That's what you are. God loves you so much, he chose you to be his example of love. God chose you for salvation. He took care of that part, and it's like over. Now what do you do? Be loved. Because as you're loved, as you are overwhelmed, gushing, squishing, splashing, dashing, and just laughing about it. You know, little kids, when you put them in a splasher pool, guess what they do? They splash. Yep, that's kind of what love is. That's God's love. God's love was made manifest to you so that you would be responding to him out of love, in love, full of love. 
love, love, love. I mean, you, know, you can get carried away with this love thing, but it's true. That's what it is. You can play with the agape, you know, I don't care where you go with that. You know, you want to go the agapeo, you know, and do the Greek, you know. Let's do the Greek, you know, and let's, uh, let's get some, uh, I don't know, Greek islands in the mix or something. I don't know, you know, some Greek kiros or food. You know, personally, I think from a Jewish perspective, I might look at it from a little different way, you know, kind of like, yeah, there's Greek mentality, you know, it's kind of a Hellenistic version of something else that went on at the time, you know, and they were kind of like being influenced by Hellenism as they began to come out of rabbinicalism, and they were going towards, you know, the spiritualism of which God was trying to intend them to be, but they didn't see it because they were trying to make the temple into something that was not, so the Herodians got involved, and that there was kind of like this corruption of the priesthood, so God moved and removed his spirit from the temple, so that now we had to have the temple of God in man rather than the, the spirit of God in the temple so that God came in the flesh in order to reveal that so the Holy Spirit could come and be manifest into all of us by way of being baptized in the Spirit so no longer be the Spirit upon people but that Spirit would come within people and that He would come out and reveal Jesus as He had already been raised from the dead and made manifest in each and every one of us through our heart as we ask Him to come into our lives and we are made manifest of what God had demonstrated to the world that He so loved which was what? Hmm? Love yeah, boils well, down to just that, love. That's all. Be loved and love. Now, you know, you want it simple, and I made it complicated in order to bring you back to the simple. And then I made the simple complicated in order to bring you back to the simple. Because that's what it boils down to. God loves you. <laughs> just don't get it. That's all. Kids do. They don't have a problem. God loves you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little children, to him they pray or something. I don't know. I don't grow. I don't do Sunday school anymore. It's like I never went to Sunday school, so I'm kind of like you know a little lost on the Sunday school song. That's why I got so excited when you know in worship services we were singing like kumbaya stuff. You know, it's like for them, for people that grew up in denominations, it was just like you know regular Sunday school. You know, Bible school times, Sunday school times. I never had that, so it was like worship. <laughs> but really. When God speaks to the church in the letters of Revelation to the Laodiceans or to all those that live in seven different letters and seven different types of peoples that there are, seven different churches, types that there are, and seven different ages that the church has gone to and all the different ramifications of how you want to apply it, whether, you know, through time, you know, that which was, that which is, and that which ever shall be, and extend that out into the moment with which you're reading it, which means that you're one of the overcomers, that you have to read it and apply it to yourself so that you have a personal application of a spiritual ramification of what God is speaking to the churches in that with which he has already revealed that is going on now, then one of them said, you lost your first love. Ah, there's that word again. First love. Ooh. First love. Ah. First love. Because you see, first love is the only kind of love that you really understand, doesn't it? Remember the first time you fell in love? <gasps> yeah. Wow. That's what it's like. Yeah. Wow. That's what God is like. Yeah, whoa, because love is blind, at least when you're in love, right? Only God's love doesn't blind you. God's love reminds you that He is love. He brings you to that place of always understanding that He is love as you grow up to become the ramifications of someone being loved in this world because the world does not have love in it. What they call love ain't love <laughs> no offense but you know loving your dog I'm sorry but if you got all your affection on a dog you can call it anything you want but between you and I hello folks your dog ain't laying down your life he may try to sacrifice himself once in a while but I'm sorry a dog is a dog is a dog that ain't no any other kind of animal except a dog and a cat is a cat is a cat so don't go there it's a cat sorry you can decorate it you can make it up you know you can put whatever you want on it but it's still a cat and, you know, you can put a lipstick on a pig, but it ain't going to kiss you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Love is made manifest by God is love. And if God created the universe, then I'm sorry, whatever you're seeing and calling love, that ain't it. But the fruit of the Spirit, we're told, is love. Because that's what God is. God is a spirit. And they don't worship him with worship of spirit and truth. So God, being a spirit, means that we, in order to know love, have to find that love from the Spirit of God. What we call love is just what poets have taught us and what we've defined in our own language for like, for fellowship, for you know motherly affection, for all these different types of 
quote, love, but not love. Not what love is. They're always derivatives. They're always lessons or lessers of what God is. They're always like a type or a metaphor or an allegory or a simile or something that's looking through a glass darkly of what real love, the word itself, is. You don't have to use the word agape. You don't have to use all these different Greek words. Eros, phileo, sturgio, and all the, you know, words that we have. There's five in Greek. Use language. Language itself is fine. You know, the love that we're talking about, that's love of, you know. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, like, I love you, and they don't mean it because they're using something else than what the real meaning of love is. God is love. If that love is like God's love, or the way God is, then you know what love is. But if what you're getting isn't God is, then it's not, pardon me, love. Now, God loves you because he died for you. He proved it. He demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus chose you. God the Father chose you and Jesus died for you because he would do the things that were pleasing to his Father and he said that, you know, hey, who are we going to send? Send me, I'll go do it, you know, I'll take care of the problem, you know, and he did. Because you had a problem. You thought you knew what love was. You don't. You thought you knew who to love. You don't. You don't know even know what love is. God is love. That's what love is. Let's say it one more time. What is love? God is love. What is love? God is love. What is love? God is love. That's the biblical answer of love. Now, you can call it love a burger and love a cat and love a dog and love your wife and love your kids and love all these other things, but I'm sorry. You're kind of using it in kind of like a you know unusual way, though you're used to it in the society of American ways of talking and walking. And I'm a poet, so I can tell you, uh-uh, that ain't love. No, it ain't. Because even in poetry, We've explored the depths and the realities of all that love is, and we come up with love, by any other name, would be Rose. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <sighs> but no, God is love. So if you're trying to deal with being loved, like I was, if you're trying to find love, and you're trying to go any other place except for God, you ain't going to get it. You ain't going to get it. You're not going to find love by being loved by a woman, a cat, a dog, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, anything in this world or anything else created. Sorry, it ain't there. It's a shallow existence and a superficial affectation rather than inflection of what God is. The inflection of what God is is by the direct relationship of having a personal intercourse with God where he moves inside you to cause love to spring forth from you. And when it springs forth from the inner being to the outer, then we feel the love. We don't feel loved and then it moves inward and suddenly it affects our heart and we like, wow, you know, wonderful, huh? I'm in love. No, you're not in love. You're in whatever you are in. And believe me, that ain't love. Because in God, you'll find love. And that's when God is in you. And the only way to find God in you is by being born again. That's the sum total of really what the gospel is. Being loved. The gospel is simple. Being loved. Being loved by God and loving God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, shall love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. We always say those for golden rules and golden tools, you know, with which you can inspire yourself and conspire to try to make a religion out of it and try to make some kind of metaphorical or some kind of, you know, great, you know, nirvana statement where you can go, yeah, I'm going to be like that. No, you're not. You aren't. Because except that God love in you and you are full of love, you are overwhelmed by love, you are filled with love, you can't love. Oh, you could come close to something that you call love. But believe me, the people that are around you that are receiving it, it ain't anything like God is love, is it? No, it's the best you could do and come up with. You know, the cards, the flowers, the candy, you know, the this, that, and the other thing. But when you choose to love, see, here's a big difference. When you sit down and you actually plan out to choose to love, then you're willing to do whatever it takes in order to demonstrate that love. And that's what God did when he chose you. He proved his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. That's the gospel message. But the gospel is, because he's done that, you can be loved, you can love, 
You can receive love and you can love because God is love. God wants you to be like him. God wants you to love him. God wants to love you. God wants to you to feel and know him in a personal intimate way so that you feel that love as well as experience that love as well as choose that love in your spirit, your soul, and your body so that you would be overwhelmed by that nature of God in you that you would no longer have a nature after the things of the world with which you are lusting and corrupted and causing yourself to go wishy-washy and up and down and running all around trying to find love in all the wrong places and all the wrong things and all the wrong attitudes and actions and things that are all enticing in this world that God created. But until you go to the source of love, you really don't have love. You just have something you think you call love. I know a lot of people that told me they love me. They're not here today. I have had everyone tell me in some way that they love me. And I have proven them wrong in some way. But you know what? God said he loved me and I went out of my way to prove he didn't. And you know what? It didn't happen. If anything, when I went out to prove that God didn't love me, I proved he did. And that's what the gospel is. God proving he loves you. You're going to find that out the hard way. Because I know you. You're probably going to go every other way to find love and love about every other thing except God is love. But the bottom line is, once you start proving and choosing to prove that God is love, you'll find out not only is God love, but God is using you to be the expression of his love to the entire universe, to the angels in heaven, to the human beings on earth, to every other form, principality, power, and spiritual wickedness in high places, as well as all the things that are going on in the entire universe of time, because you are going to be the demonstrable effect, as well as effect, of what God is. And that will be you. Because as soon as you realize that when you see Jesus, you've seen the Father, you're going to realize what God is doing to you. He's making you the example of love. Because as soon as someone looks at you, they'll see Jesus. As soon as someone looks at you, they'll see the Father. Now that's a scary thought. Because if you have seen you, have you seen the Father? If you've seen me, have you seen the Father? No. But if you start to see me as love, then you've seen the Father. And more than that, You've seen Jesus. And that's why you really want to get a handle on this gospel thing. You really want to get a handle on this good news. The good news is you're loved. So be loved. Be loved. Because as you are loved, you'll be able to say, I am, so to speak. You know, we're playing on metaphors about, you know, I am, will be, God is, and all that. But the reality of love is what God is, and that's what the nature of God will become in you. You will be the revelation of God to a wicked and perverse generation in and of itself that at this latter days doesn't know what love is anymore, but will call every other thing love except for one. God is love.